Thank you guys so much for coming. I am Liz Lesner, along with Matt Keel, co-founders of Yes We Cannibal. Yes We Cannibal is a project space uh, for experimentation in new thought, art, music, performance, social research, and we hope food, uh, if we can ever get over the COVID hump. Um, you are at our 22nd Sunday Salon called Meat Meats. Uh, we want to welcome you to Yugo's presentation, where he'll be discussing with a panel uh, of his fellow filmmakers his current project, The Social Boot, um, a documentary look at social disinvestment and healthcare issues in Louisiana. Um, coming up, we have Renee Reed and our own Hal Lambert. Uh, that'll be next Sunday. These meet meets are always free and from four to six every Sunday. So if this is your first meet meet, we hope to see you again. Um, our meet meets are always something that doesn't have a natural home in Baton Rouge and they're always something that's a new idea. S one more thing that I wanna ask you to consider is to consider supporting this project um, because it's this kind of ethos about inviting people together that's let us work with Hugo. We met Hugo at a gallery opening that he participated in the show, and we were thrilled to have conversations with him about this project that he's working on now. So we can't say how excited we are to hear him present about this work in progress um, and hear more about where this idea has gone, because when we first met him, this idea was just in its beginning stages. So, um, the way that we do that and the way that we keep it free is through micro patronage. And we really need support to help keep these doors open and help keep programs like this happening. Um, you can learn more about our Patreon platform on www.patreon.com slash yesweekcannibal. Um, you can join at a $1 level, a $10 level, or any level of your choosing. And if you join at any level, you are eligible for a piece of artwork um, raffled off by exhibiting artists. So please consider joining. We're really uh, in need of 13 more micro patrons to make our September goal. Uh, we would love it if one of them was you. We also have some merchandise available and uh, any other question you have, please feel free. I'm gonna hand it over to Hugo right now. He can introduce his panelists. Thank you so much. this thing working it is working uh, yeah so uh, first of all I do want to thank everyone for showing up today um, my name is Ugona Njoku um, Ugo Njoku for short um, I am 21 years old I am this was this is my first uh, film project so I'm a first-time film director uh, I'm also a dual degree candidate in psychology and sociology at LSU um, I also do a lot of different forms of visual art, and so, like I said, this is my first uh, film project, and it is called The Social Boot, Boundaries Unchained, and it is a part of a lar larger project, a larger network called The Social Boot Project, and so with The Social Boot Project, it's kind of, the intention there is that, you know, we kind of are able to make our own tables rather than asking for a seat at any table. So um, a lot of times people think that things like this are kind of unreachable, but through community and even networking, um, these things are very achievable. And so uh, myself, I'm up here, and I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. Uh, Clay Milnick, uh, he, we're actually filming right now scenes for the documentary as we do this. So Clay is kind of setting things up over there. He will be sitting right here next to me. Um, Uzo is right here, this is my little sister. And Mia Upshaw is the gracious producer of this film. And I'll let everyone else introduce themselves starting with Uzo. So, uh, that was right there. 
Um, my name is Uzo Amaka Njoku. I go by Uzo just because my first name is really long. And um, I'm Ugo's sister, of course. Um, I kind of really dabble in everything, um, but for right now, I'm kind of helping out with the project, um, kind of flowing wherever I'm needed, and I can't wait for you all to see the final product. Hi guys, my name is Mia Upshaw, and I'm the producer. I also have a production company called Mia Upshaw Productions that I've had since I was 16 years old. I'm 20 and I go to Loyola University of New Orleans and my major is digital filmmaking. And um, me and Ugo pretty much work side by side on this project. I help him develop ideas for all of the scenes throughout the documentary. Um, I also kind of help him direct a little bit. And so because it was his first film and I think this might be my seventh film project so far, um, I kind of hold his hand throughout the whole process and really help him cultivate himself as a filmmaker and a director. And then I also help him come up with ideas for the project overall. And um, like I said, Clay is kind of setting things up back there. He will be up here kind of when he is done doing his thing. But um, I guess I'm gonna get a little bit more into the overall social boot project. So this film, is it intends to be a big bang to, and it's not necessarily, the film is not gonna be a final product. It's gonna be kind of a beginning of more to come. Um, and that more can be in the spaces of film, uh, music, research. Uh, I'm actually for my senior thesis going to do things that kind of tie into the framework of the social boot. Uh, boundaries Unchained, the subject matter of it. So the film itself uh, looks at two primary things. So one being uh, the kind of internal, internal conflict we all have as people of feeling included or excluded in space, uh, insider or outsider. And so uh, we all kind of feel that at any point in time in our lives. I'm, I'm sure everyone else in here can kind of speak to that in their own special way um, of feeling included in the space or excluded in the space, uh, whether that is a community, a team, a group, university, city, anything like that. So um, basically this film looks at that, but it also looks at it through a number of different lenses. And so one particular lens being healthcare accessibility, just because um, here in Baton Rouge and Louisiana as a whole, there is a lot in terms of disparities in healthcare accessibility. Um, you can look at this city alone, um, the north side, the city is kind of divided among Florida Boulevard and even to a lesser extent Government Street, which is just outside um, in that north of Government Street and Florida Boulevard, uh, you can kind of see that there's a scarcity in resources in that area when compared to south of that area. And so, Personally, for me, I was actually born um, in Women's Hospital on Airline Highway. That is now the Baton Rouge Police Station. Um, and so that was one of many things that kind of was in my consciousness as I conceptualized this film. And um, also, my father, he did a lot of DME medical supply work. So that is looking at hospital beds, wheelchairs, delivering those things to uh, lower income people in Louisiana. And so that's kind of something I was taking in at a young age and it kind of occupied my consciousness. And so ultimately, this whole, this whole social boot thing has kind of been, it's not something that necessarily recently started, it's kind of been a lifelong thing. And so uh, last year during quarantine, uh, we actually, myself and a few other people actually worked on a Juneteenth project with the city of Baton Rouge. And so that's actually how I was able to meet Clay. And Clay um, was gracious enough to kind of hear me out and I was able to kind of run the idea by him. And so he was one of the first people outside of family to kind of be a believer in this project. And so I'm very appreciative for that. And then uh, December of 2020, I actually reached out to Mia and uh, she'd be able to speak more on that. But um, I actually reached out to her and she also voiced her support for the project. And, came on as a producer, and so the rest has more or less been history for the most part, so uh, that's kind of where we stand with that. But um, 
I'll open the floor to kind of everyone else to kind of give their interpretations of the film and the overall project. So yeah. Um, to kind of piggyback off of what my brother said, um, kind of in the early days of this idea, um, he kind of came up with it in our house. But yeah, he kind of came up with it um, upstairs in our game room in our house, and he was kind of asking me like, oh, what do you think about this? And kind of asking for my feedback. So of course, we have a lot of intuitive conversations and like conversations filled with substance. So um, during that time period, it was kind of like a gray area, but now the whole kind of project has developed and it's kind of more clear to our eyes, and I hope it's clear to everyone else's eyes that kind of sees it, whether it be on social media or by word of mouth. Um, but yeah, it's very exciting to see everything happen the way it's been happening, and I'm very thankful for you guys being here right now, as well as everyone who's helped out, so. Um, okay, so we're gonna reach out to me around the same time, like the same time he told you, December 2020 through Twitter. And um, I actually thought he was a girl at first because of his name. Um, Unisex. And then, and then we met uh, through Zoom, and then he just, you know, pitched his ideas to me like a lot of filmmakers do, and I was interested in it. Um, then I was also working on other film projects at, at that time, too, so I'll be working on, like, two or three film projects at a time and producing and helping other filmmakers, you know, come up with their ideas. And so then you know we kind of the process started really slow but then as i started to wind down and the semester came to an end we started to really hone it and focus more on what exactly he wanted for his vision for the film and so him being a first you know filmmaker he wasn't that knowledgeable about how things ran and so that's where i came in and i helped him you know really formulate a lot of his ideas and then I mean, since then, I think since February, maybe we, we would have like a meeting every week and it would be intense, like hours. And then as we got closer to filming, we would have um, production meetings that would go on for hours and I would have them like write out with these little like worksheets and stuff like that to help further develop his ideas more. But um, at the time, I thought it was going to be like, you know, a really small film project, but then once I got on set, I got to meet all these am amazing uh, black creatives, and it kind of opened up my mind more of how the social boot is starting to become bigger than us, so. Yeah, and I can speak to that a little bit more in that um, I feel like anyone that's ever had a big idea can kind of understand that with big ideas, there comes twists and turns. And so um, those twists and turns based on perspective can either be good things or bad things. It's just about what you make of it. And so um, I've always kind of throughout my life tried to make the most of twists and turns that uh, we do encounter. So one such example, I guess, during filming was uh, we actually went to the bottom of the map, uh, Port Austin, Louisiana. That's literal bottom of the boot. Um, there's a map somewhere you can point at it and it's gonna be there. And so basically um, we were down there to actually, um, cause we're getting a lot of different perspectives for the film. And so uh, this particular day we were getting the indigenous people's perspective. So the Native American perspective. And so um, as we're driving down, uh, one of the people, one of the chiefs were actually planning on, we were planning on interviewing actually had to uh, cancel on me and this was because he needed to cut his grass and so I I don't take anything personally per se and I respected it and so I came to realize why that was and so down there um, and really in Louisiana period I'm sure everybody knows it's been raining a lot and so when you get to the coast you know the water, there's more water down there and so you want to they want to kind of I guess cut their like any time you can cut your grass, that's kind of like a really big thing down there. So I came to understand that as I interviewed uh, another person that we were able to get um, kind of the interview with um, at the Port Ocean site. And so that was kind of an example of us kind of rolling with the punches and just kind of making things happen regardless because we were able to, instead of the time we would have taken to kind of get his interview in, uh, we actually were able to go to the docks 
and kind of get footage of the coastline and everything like that, and it was really cool. And apparently there are dolphins down there now. Um, I didn't know there were dolphins in Louisiana before I saw that, but um, yeah, because of like climate change and things like that, there are dolphins there. So it is a really cool thing, but it is also unfortunate that climate change has kind of brought that sort of thing there. But um, I kind of give that little story just to kind of speak to the fact that um, we've had to be fluid throughout this process. Um, and it's been something that everyone has kind of taken in stride and been very welcoming towards. Um, I'm a pretty spontaneous person, so I, I'll literally be in the shower sometimes and I'll think of something and then I'll send a voice memo message to Mia and I'm like, look Mia, we should probably like, like let's, let's think about doing this. And so basically, that's kind of been what it's been and it's been very fun and I've been very appreciative to particularly Mia and Clay being that they have background in filmmaking and I am a first timer with this but they've respected kind of my process and they've kind of, we've kind of given each other things. So they've kind of, I've been able to kind of soak in their experiences and things like that to take and implement into my filmmaking process and uh, I would hope that they've been able to kind of take things from me as well. They would be able to speak to that better than, better than I would. But yeah, all in all, it's been pretty, pretty fun. So yeah, it's been, it's been an experience. I've had, I've had a time of my life doing this, um, especially because this summer has been a pretty hectic and busy one for me, uh, taking summer classes and things like that. But it's been really fun. Were you about to say something? I don't know, I thought you were gonna say something. Oh no, um, there was something that you mentioned and I was gonna talk more about it, but now I can't remember, so never mind. Okay, yeah, um, and mind you, this is kind of our first time kind of having a panel like this, so it's really, I liken it to, I've been calling it Comic Con jokingly, um, just because uh, we went, my sister and I, we went to Comic Con in 2017. We were down there seeing the festivities and everything like that. So it was a really pretty, it was a pretty cool thing. So this is kind of a full circle experience based on that. So yeah, she okay. remembers. Okay. So um, so yeah. So I could tell how much impact the film has had for Uzo and uh, Ugo and how much um, he's actually been wanting to do something like this for a long time and now he finally has the opportunity to. And over this project I've come across so many uh, videographers who want that end into the industry to then become directors or uh, directors of photography or cinematographers in that and I think it's really cool um, just listening to their stories and giving them advice and telling them, okay, this is what you need to do and this is that, and you could come with me on this set and I'll show you how to do this, but it's definitely, this is definitely given the opportunity for people who want that in in the film industry and who want that experience to just come on set and not feel intimidated and not feel like you have to know everything, you know. All right, and um, Clay, I'm gonna invite you up here just to kind of give your little um, sentiment and your little spiel and everything like that. And then from there, we actually have a few special things for you guys. Um, some videos that, one of them we actually kind of pulled an all-nighter last night and put together. But um, I just wanted to let Clay kind of speak his piece on kind of his perspective with the film and everything. Um, well, hi, I'm Clay. Uh, I went to LSU Film School and uh, around last summer, uh, my girlfriend met with somebody from Ugo's team at Action Awareness and connected me with him. And um, really from there, we've just been working on this documentary. Uh, it's been about over a year now. And it's, I mean, I've, I, I enjoyed Ugo's vision um, in the first place and then from there, it was experience and just being part of a team is what enticed me um, a lot about this. And from from there, Ugo has just impressed me every step of the way with the, the networking he's done and the planning and just what he's presented me um, has just driven me to, to want to come to every meeting and, and be involved with this. Um, 
and since we've started the editing, especially, it's stuff has started to come together, and it's it's really satisfying um, just working on a documentary like this. Um, so yeah, I mean that's been my experience with this so far. It's been a lot of fun with Hugo. I wanted to say something really quick. So to kind of tag on what uh, Clay was saying, um, Ugo really planned out the documentary very well for somebody who this is their first film. And I mean, the people that he brought on set, the team that he picked to come on set every day and the people and places of what he, what we're gonna include in the documentary is so thought out and so planned. I would have never really knew that this was his first documentary. And he really took the time to find specific people that he knew he wanted to interview. And we just have such a diverse group of people that are going to be in this documentary. And so um, if, if the video is ready, um, or if the videos are ready, um, we can definitely get that started. Um, so the first video will be actually, um, yeah, that could be the first video. Channel surfing will be the last one. And the longest video will be the last one, the channel surfing one. And then the second one will be one of the free verses we've done, so yeah. I definitely believe that logically it has to um, lead to increased fatalities and uh, mortality rates of people who otherwise could have been saved. Um, a prime example of something like that, which uh, my father, my dad had a stroke, my stepdad had a stroke last summer and um, he developed severe brain damage as a result. And the doctor stated that it had everything to do with the amount of time that had elapsed between his stroke and him having access to this clot busting medication. Um, the nearest hospital to him was Lane Memorial. He gets there, their ICU is full. So they decide, hey, let's call Baton Rouge, um, Our Lady of the Lake, Baton Rouge General, ICU is full, you know, it's a pandemic. They had to get him to New Orleans, which is an hour away. Um, the weather didn't permit for him to be airlifted, so he had to go by ambulance. So it was close to two hours before he could get this life-saving medication that could have prevented him from having the um, as, as much brain damage as he has from the stroke. So when I thought about his experience, and I think about that, your regular, you, you, the gunshots, the accident victims, your, your heart attack patients, your stroke patients, whenever I see an ambulance on my side of town, uh, I can't help but say a prayer to myself, uh, you know, about whatever's going on because they have to go way far out to be able to get medical care and um, that just seems so unfair. It's almost like north of Florida Boulevard is a medical care desert, if it makes any sense. Stuck up in a city where healthcare ain't accessible. Government positions only leave me feeling skeptical, vegetable. Feeling like they won't help me at all. This terrain is gonna set me ashore, but will I fall? I'm not sure, I just walk around my spot with my friends. Look for our ends, you know it depends. Look at my skin, see how it blends. Go to the court system and see if I win. Walk down the same street, walk in the same heat. Walk to our fleet, deplete, simple. How can I change, invent through this instrumental? Spoken word, how I can speak to it feel simple. How can I tell my mom if I can get the dental? How can I fix these problems every day that I get through? Vent through to all of my people if they can listen. Still in the same spot, still in the same position. Looking to my friends, not looking to politicians. Stuck up in this terrain, hoping it changes. Simple. Come in, what's happening? Everything is happening. Hi, 
Mobius Madfoot here. If you're watching this, then you've most likely made the conscious and very smart decision of tapping in with the Social Boot Network. The next few minutes are going to show you why. This is water, everyone. So I would say this. So the, the 2020 um, COVID pandemic really revealed what was already in existence, which was the inequities that we see in health. But we are also were suffering at the same time simultaneously from a racial pandemic. Shotgun puts Collie in motion, looks in his direction. It's picked <laughs> off! It's picked off! It's Tracy Porter again! What you do and where you're from. You want my government name or just my nickname? Whichever one. I'm Bando Pat. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Baton Rouge. And maybe if that one got repainted, probably. Yeah. I would like. This one right here? Yeah, this one. I, like I hate the color pink. Oh, you don't like the color pink? What's your favorite color? Um, black, purple. But you purple like is my favorite. Yeah, I like orange. Orange is my favorite color. No, no, because that's what was not, you're not getting their tax ID number. You're the fourth person. Y'all not finna run PPP scams through my business. You're the fourth person in the family that done tried to do this. No PPP, okay? I love you, mama. And now I look at every situation as like, I could do it. All I got to do is learn it. But nothing is impossible for me to do now. And I have to thank myself for going through all those trials and tribulations early on in my life. Hey, cause he got in like oh seven. It's a hard jacket, even though I'm not a Saints fan. Yeah. Still a hard jacket. Action. Station identification. Experiences inspiring creations, creations inspiring experiences. This cycle of pain will not be in vain. For the thing about pain is that it too is like rain. And what does rain do? Subside. Station identification for your viewing pleasure. What side of the spectrum are you on? Increasingly, we're aware that we're a web or a network or entangled or whatever kind of word you want to use to talk about it, um, you can't, you can't effectively cast someone out, right? And you can see that with the prison industrial complex and all the problems that creates. So you can't cast a human being out. They're, they're still enmeshed in these networks. Okay, that's all the time I've got. I gotta get back to playing Animal Crossing New Leaf on my Nintendo 3DS. Well, I'd say that just about does it. Need I say more? Very replenishing. Cut. Yeah, um, so basically these, um, these videos are just kind of like a short snippet of what the documentary will look like and also other videos that we're going to be putting out as a social boot. And um, if you want to, we can talk about the creative process behind a lot of these videos and um, all the long nights we sat in the editing studio trying to edit them and everything like that. But um, but yeah, I think a lot of the subjects in the documentary have very interesting perspectives about healthcare, um, and a lot of things that that I didn't know about, and I think that everybody, especially in our generation and our age, needs to know about what's going on in their city. Yeah, but um, I, could, I think at this time we'll open the floor to questions. So um, if anyone has any questions, um, 
feel free to shoot them at us and we'll answer to the best of our abilities. Yeah, so that's been um, that's been pretty uh, in, an interesting kind of dynamic in itself, and everyone else will kind of get their chance to speak on it. But um, from my perspective, um, in initially formulating this film, um, not that it was going to be completely black and white, but the gray area wasn't necessarily going to be showcased. But as we've been filming, we decided, and as we've had more people on board, like Taj right here uh, with his uh, VHS camera and everything like that, we've decided to also, with documenting some of the things we're touching on in the film, also document our journeys and our travels in doing that. And so at the start of filming, it's interesting because it was like at the start of the summer, we nationally, it was kind of, a sentiment that we were through the roughest part of the pandemic. But literally, as we're filming, the Delta variant goes from simply being in the back of our minds to where in Louisiana, it starts to kind of have a resurgence. And so that results in people even in crew catching COVID. And then that's kind of something that we decided, we've been very honest with our kind of approach to that because we want it to be authentic and as real as possible because what happens a lot of times with some of these documentaries, they may be, for lack of a better term, pretentious, and they don't necessarily have the heart of the people affected in mind. But um, this film is for the audience that you see in the film. So it's for anyone from the Vietnam veteran living in New Orleans East to the 10-year-old kid that has NFL dreams that lives in Baton Rouge, so it's that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the whole the serving size that we want to touch here, basically. And I'll let everybody kind of speak on that in their own perspective as well. Yeah, it's been pretty interesting. I mean, given that we are in a pandemic, that's something that we kind of keep operating with, like in our forefront, because, like he said, Delta is very much here in Louisiana. Um, but it's actually kind of interesting because um, one of the locations we went to in New Orleans, it's, um, it's called the Roots of Music. Uh, we actually went there twice, actually. And so the first time we went, we got all of the things that we needed to get footage-wise. And um, we were actually amongst a lot of um, youth. So I believe they're from, I think it's sixth to ninth grade, I believe. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, but yeah, so it's the one of it was the little girl that you guys saw in the video. And so we didn't end up getting everything we needed. So a couple of weeks ago we kind of went back, but like I said, Delta is very much here. So some of the kids that actually go to the facility, the roots of music, they actually ended up catching COVID. So it was it's very realistic in the fact that the film and the project itself touches on the um, disparities in healthcare, not only in Louisiana, but like in other states. So we actually got to see that come to life, so to say, which is not ideally what you would want because this is real life, like people's health and things. But um, it was very, it, it made every, I don't know, it kind of reinforced the reality and everything that we're doing related to the project and just like life in general. If and that it served as motivation sense. also. So yeah. yeah. Um, so, like I said, so I've been filming for a long time, and so the pandemic really shook things up. So I had really got into my filming bag, I should say, when I was a freshman in college. And so we went from having normal productions to then everything just coming to a halt. And then, you know, the pandemic started, we had to leave school, we had to drop everything, drop all of our projects, return equipment, you know, stuff like that. And then we were just still for a long time. And then it also brought up the question of, okay, how are we gonna start filming and everything? And then we would still have class. And so we would have to discuss ways that people, that people on a more bigger scale, like bigger production companies, how are they filming? And how are we gonna bring that back to school and how we're gonna bring that back into our own personal projects. And so it's really hard 
to film and put on a production with COVID because you want everybody to be safe, um, but you also want to get good material as well. So it went from us dropping everything and then us coming back and making sure everybody is safe. And it's a really hard thing to do. Not everybody can come on set. Not everybody can film the way that they want to. Everybody has to get tested. Some people don't want to get tested and some people want to do this. And me being the producer, I have to make a lot of the tough decisions and I have to, you know, not always be nice and everything. Um, but then we started filming for the social boot kind of when things were starting to die down, when people got more, um, more vaccines, people became more confident coming together. And so we, we got filming pretty easily. You know, um, we didn't really have to get tested as much. A lot of times when you come on set, you have to be tested twice in a day, like before you come there and then right before you're about to film and sometimes when you leave. And if you test positive, you can't film. And if, you know, an actor tests positive, you have to redo the whole set day. But for this, COVID has been a concern, but it has not been something difficult in the road. Um, but now we're starting to become bigger and we're about to film in other cities, but the Delta variant has come back. Um, and we do have some protection with the vaccine, but it's just, it's kind of hard, you know, because you grow so closely to people on set and your crew, and then now you can't be around everybody and you know, you're kind of stagnant and in the stagnant and in the film industry, like you rely heavy on filming, but you can't all come together because it's a pandemic. So it's definitely been a setback and a change. So. And uh, if I may kind of build on that, um, I know in my life, I, I like to use setbacks. It's kind of like what I said earlier with rolling with the punches. Um, it's important to be able to do that. It's important to be able to be fluid, um, be like water, and roll with the punches. And rather than kind of having it, having those setbacks take over your consciousness, it's important to shift those setbacks into motivation. And so hopefully, and I have all the confidence in the world that we will be able to um, tell this story and kind of tell the story of our experiences dealing with filming during a pandemic about disparities, ironically, and then having some of these disparities resurface um, as they have, we'll be able to tell that story as uniquely as possible. And I have, again, all the confidence in the world and my crew that we will be able to because um, we are all going into this very honestly. Um, we're going into this very fearlessly, and we're going into this with a bigger picture in mind and we're really trying to do what we can to make our work as transformative as possible because if our work is as transformative as possible then the people affected by that work will inevitably be transformed by it for better and so that's what we hope to be able to continue to do as we kind of go to these other cities these other states for filming because the vision has expanded so yeah any further questions? Okay, Matt. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about limited, but um, I mean, one, as I, I sort of said, it's an Instagram post, uh, just to go with the story of what you guys have ever watched you, and I watched, like, uh, you go first, the uh, talent, talking with you on the project, I was like, this is so amazing, it's taking a long time, and it's just blown away. Through, you know, all the memories from all of you. But I noticed, one, you guys are getting collaborations, right? And I'm curious about Yeah, um, I'll, I'll answer the latter part first. Um, and so basically, Mobius Madfoot is a character I created. Um, I actually did 
a writing piece for a designer that was rolling out a clothing collection. And so in doing that, um, I kind of, uh, he, we did it in the form of a news article. So Mobius Madfoot was basically the author of that news article, basically. So this was me putting that from paper to real life. And so as a, another thing with the network, um, when I say the social boot network, there's multiple meanings of the word network. So of course you're networking, but also network television. That's why we had the whole channel surfing con uh, concept. So basically it's going from one channel to the next. So it's going from, we're talking about what Dr. Denner was talking about with the pandemic and everything like that, to uh, like uh, late night before t uh, local television goes off air, Mobius Madfoot is introducing like some random programming to the, 2010 Super Bowl to yada, 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 that goes on like that. So that's kind of what that was. And then speaking to the second point, um, collaboration, um, we, live in a, we live in a world in which, and I'm a very individual, like individualistic person in the sense that I am very original and I like creative autonomy. But um, I feel like a lot of people nowadays see individualism as they should kind of make it about themselves. And I've never been of that mindset because I've always believed that there is power in numbers and you're able to, one, be able to get your creative autonomy, but it's just more special when you do it with people that uh, you care about, you respect, and you work with, while, and they're able to see their vision through. And so, that's kind of what um, myself, Mia, Clay, especially, uh, we were all, initially when we had our first meetings, I wanted, I made sure to drive the point home that this isn't, this is never a dictatorship, no egos or anything like that. Um, I'm learning from them. And so I'm learning from their experiences. We're all, in this world, we're all taking experiences from each other and we're, drawing it into our experiences. So that's literally how it's working. And so basically with that, um, we're gonna incorporate things like that into the film to where it's not necessarily going to look like your run of the mill cookie cutter documentary because it's gonna have the honesty of an 808 Taj right there or a Mia Upshaw Productions or a Pixel Collective or an Ugo Vision or an Uzo vision, beefing at their wedding, or like anything like that. So it's just a, <laughs> it's just a, uh, this is bigger than me. And so this whole social boot project is bigger than me. And so that's always been kind of the collaborative spirit that we wanted to have because of course, we're not, it's not just anybody necessarily getting to collaborate, if that makes sense. It's people that have something to say, a story to tell, so yeah. Yeah. You're selling you. You guys are really selling, you know, Yeah. Yeah, and um before I kinda let the floor open up, um basically that's the intention. Um because again there is power in numbers and so um I listen to the Wu Tang clan and so it's kind of like a similar approach to them in that uh the RZA, that's kind of one of the guys that was really uh, instrumental in making the Wu-Tang Clan a thing. So basically the special thing about them was that they together were the Wu-Tang Clan, but they were doing a lot of things to where they were individually able to get their own record deals and be able to do their thing. But when it was time to come back to being like Wu-Tang mode, they were able to do that and drop critically acclaimed albums. So it's kind of the same mindset. Um, I may do a film, uh, Taj may do a compilation or anything like that, Mia may do another film or whatever, but when it's time for us to get back together, we get back together as the Social Boot Network and we just, we make magic. And so I'll let them speak more yeah, on that. I have one more question now. Okay. okay. Um, well, Wu-Tang is, 
Wu Tang is more more so. I don't know that they would know about Wu Tang as much as I do, but um, that's kind of just my mentality on it. So yeah. Okay. So. Yes. So. We had somebody from the audience ask about how do we collaborate, and then the second question was, what was the second question? Okay. Um, so I've been, yeah, yeah. I mean, me personally, I've been working with filmmakers since I was 16, so I have so many different experiences with so many different filmmakers, um, but, Collaborating with everybody is very important because when you meet with a filmmaker, you know, they have their team and then you have your team. And nine times out of ten, our teams mesh, um, you know, really well. But being the producer for me, you have to be able to read everybody and you have to look them in the eyes and, you know, make them feel like they're seen and respect their ideas. But you have to also know that everybody has boundaries. So if you're... Um, a PA and a director, everybody's equal. You treat everybody the same, but they cannot just come out the blue and start directing. You know, everybody has their roles, but also you want to leave the floor open so everybody can feel free to say whatever they want to. Um, I think we've we we've always throughout this whole project we've had such good relationships collaborating with people, and and also one of my main jobs is reading the filmmaker and reading what they want to happen because my job is to help them put out their vision and help them see that this can be something bigger and we can do all these things you know and let them know what can we do and what can't we do and so working with Ugo I had to learn um, who he is as a person and and I can tell when he likes something when he likes an idea when he kind of doesn't like it and when he doesn't like it at all and so every filmmaker is different I mean I've had experiences with um, crews where we didn't really talk that much it was just business and I've had experiences with uh, crew members where I still talk to today I even had one filmmaker just up and left to Egypt after, you know, we were filming. And I was like, girl, we got to edit the film. Like, where are you going? You know, but collaborating with everybody and making sure everybody is included is important, but also making sure that everybody's treated equally, but everybody knows their boundaries. And um, really, as a filmmaker, you're going to have your crew. So every you know, idea that you do, you're gonna have the same people around you that you know you work well with. And so I think that's the most important. Ugo brought on people that he knows he works well with, that, that they all bring out this creative side out of each other. And so, you know, me working with them has elevated my creative side as well. So does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> As far as the um, collaborative efforts that you asked about, I don't know, like with doing, well, honestly, in life, I feel like everybody kind of has their niche, but as life's experiences kind of fold out, whether it be like, oh, something happened, or like school as an example, like kind of, I don't know, it'll kind of put you in a haze where you'll kind of be drawn away from whatever you're most passionate about. Um, but it just really takes tapping back into that and just like kind of letting that light stay lit behind you wherever it may be and then you can kind of um, kind of let your talent show so like with this film there's been a lot of people that kind of they've came up to us and asked like oh I'd like to be like a part like how can I help you guys out and then you kind of learn like a lot of people I didn't even know that they did whatever they do, whether it be like photography or videography or like acting or something like that. But like they do have that talent, they just kind of didn't really have the opportunity to um, execute whatever it may be. So I feel like coming together with people kind of allows for you to be more expressive with whatever you're trying to express and kind of, um, kind of dive back into what you really, really, really want to do in life. So. That's for my answer for like the first part of your question. And then I forgot the second part. It's okay if, though. But yeah, if I may build on that. Uh, yeah, that's and another perk of collaboration in this, in the context of this film is that um, we all, I don't, no one on the crew is 
a, was born before the year 96, I think. So we're all really young. And so with that being said, um, some of, well, good amount of us are in college. And so um, I know for me, I'm actually pursuing a dual degree. And so with that, I kind of, I'm on a never ending, I guess, quest to find balance in that sense. So there is times that, especially early on, probably in pre-production that I got very, very overwhelmed. And so, and that's just being honest, that's just being real. Um, I had to learn how to kind of balance those things and I had to learn how to defer certain things to different people. So um, like these, um, Uzo actually made these. Um, and so they consist of kind of explaining what the social boot is about as well as a QR code to the GoFundMe, which you guys can definitely, you know what I'm saying, donate to. Uh, anything helps, you know what I'm saying, as little as $5, something to keep in mind. But um, besides that, um, it's just kind of, that's symbolic of the fact that everybody kind of has, I'm, I'm bad at asking for help. And so in doing this, I've gotten better at asking for help um, or even allowing people to help me to where sometimes I may need to make a call, but I may not have the mental capacity to make that call at the time, at that moment, to where Mia might step in and be like, okay, I'll just make that call for you. Um, I'm here for you. Um, I'm the producer. I'm here to hold your hand. She tells me that all the time. And so I'm also very appreciative of that. But um, basically, that's it's kind of a microcosm of society. That's really something that I'm not going to say society has necessarily lost, but you don't see it on display as much in the mainstream. So what we want to do here is restore that feeling. Um, let everyone know that, look, if you're involved in this, there is some sort of family dynamic to it to where if you need something, we can provide that to you. Or we can at least do our part to point you in the right direction of providing that to you. So yeah. But um, any other questions? George? Yes. Okay, so I know the film isn't done yet, but I'm just curious for y'all doing the film, what exactly is this film inspiring you to do, uh, inspiring you to do in the future? Because you're doing a healthcare disparity now, but are y'all wanting to do something more creative, or do y'all want to do a docu-series type thing? So I'm just kind of trying to figure out, like, what is this film leading to in the future? What is your end goal with the filmmaking? Um, you want to answer this? First? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. So, basically, um, throughout this process, I'm encouraging Ugo to reach out to other areas of film. So, we're after this, we're gonna work on his feature. So that's a more like serious, you know, type of film. But I think this is going to leave the door open to us continuing the social boot in a different sector with a different type of documentary. And then we might do a TV show, you know, we might do something different, but yes, this is not gonna be the only time that we're going to be making a film. Um, I can tell that this is something that he's been wanting to do for a long time. And he has a lot of ideas and things to bring to the table that'll make good uh, movies and entertainment. And so what my company does is we're gonna help him formulate a lot of those ideas and just you know keep going from here. Yeah, and building on that, um, I, this isn't, like she said, this isn't, I've always wanted to do things like this. And so um, this was never meant to be the only, this was never meant to be a one-off. Um, there's definitely more coming. Um, I, I've always wanted to do like sh short films. Um, I have the idea um, for the next feature like she was talking about. I've actually run it to her. Um, when that time comes, we'll build on it. But um, this is definitely not the end, if that makes sense. And along with that, it's not just the, not the end for myself, but it's also other people that may want to Put a film together. So, Joris, let's say you want to do a film or something like that. It's definitely there's a forum for you to be able to kind of see that through. Um, because what happens is I, I like to look at how I reached out to Clay and Mia a lot, just because um, I was very detailed on what I wanted to ultimately do, and so that foundation has moved us to this point where I'm actually able to speak on it in front of this audience. And so basically in that same spirit, um, 
we we're encouraging others that may want to do films as well or TV shows. Um, for example, Uzo, she has something that she's going to do down the line called the Zozone, Zone. And so that's, um, she can speak to that better than I can, but it's just encouraging that creativity amongst everybody because like, like she said, um, sometimes people want to do these things, but they may be a little timid in expressing that. Whereas if they have a network of people that would be able to encourage that expression, they're able to see it through through that. So yeah. Yeah, further. Okay. Well, yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um yeah, so uh of course these things are still kind of Okay, yeah, I apologize for that. And so, yes, the question was, do we have plans for uh, some sort of release programming? And so, um, to answer that question, um, yes, that's something we would definitely, we're definitely kind of conceptualizing what that would look like. Um, Delta's thrown us a curveball, um, being that, you know, this is the type of thing we would love to do in person, but uh, the film is, we're plan setting to release it in 2022, and so, we plan on um, doing things even with some of the entities that we have been able to interview. Um, like Kaya is actually in the audience. She uh, works with uh, Parole Project. And so we did uh, a lot of our first week interviews in Baton Rouge at Parole Project. That's an organization that works with uh, formerly incarcerated individuals that have been incarcerated for a long time. And so we plan on doing things such as screenings with them as well. And so. Uh, different private screens, but we also want to actually submit it to festivals, and so we're going to adhere to uh, some of the rules of those festivals. But um, to answer your question, yes. Yes, so as we speak, we've been um, for a couple months now coming up and brainstorming different ideas to not only market the movie, but to market uh, the network. And so, yeah, so we're going to be doing a lot of different premieres, a lot of different screenings. Uh, Liz, you had a question? Yeah, I'm, well, I was curious about any preconceived notions you had going in and any experiences made in the film that really shifted that for you. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so being that this was my first film, um, I n didn't necessarily have a frame of reference for the whole process of filmmaking beyond kind of some stuff that I had done in high school under a digital media program and things like that. But of course, that's not as larger scale as this um, to where I didn't quite know, I guess, um, I guess in terms of like interviews, uh, I didn't quite know that as I'm filming, I'm going to even get more ideas on set. And so literally I would have moments where I'm in the roots of music when, as we're touring the facility where a light bulb kind of sparks in my head is like, oh, we need to do this. And then I put it in my notes, and then I run it by Mia, and then we get to brainstorming on that. So things like that have always been happening because like, um, like I alluded to earlier, it's basically having a big idea, you have to be cognizant of the fact that there will be twists and turns, and you have to be sure that those twists and turns are for the better. So. Yeah, if that answers your question, basically, yes. Sort of, because you had a conversation that changed your ideas about what you were doing. Okay, um, yeah, did I have conversations that changed what I was doing? I wouldn't say that changed it, but maybe that altered it a little bit, because initially the film was more or less strictly going to be about the disparities, but um, I guess in the back of my mind, I always knew there could be a more creative way to kind of point hint at that um, because I never wanted the film to be too clinical. Um, I always wanted it, uh, I spoke about the audience that I would want earlier. And so um, as we've kind of gotten into the process, certain interviews I've had with individuals, I'd say at Parole Project, that kind of got me thinking, okay, um, we can look at this insider-outsider thing a bit more because what happens is that internal 
everything in this life is perspective based. So that internal perspective that you may have of yourself as an insider in one space or an outsider in another space ultimately affects your physical and mental health. And it affects those things based on how you may feel about yourself or based on, at the higher level, the policies that whatever powers may be may implement on, for example, women in um, the whole pro-life, pro-choice thing or even uh, mental health for athletes that may be dealing with some sort of depression because what's happening now in the Olympics is athletes are now kind of getting the courage to step back in the name of their mental health, which I'm all for. Shout out to Simone Biles for that. Um, because for a long time, and I was an athlete myself in high school, um, sometimes I would feel like I had something to prove. Um, and then that kind of ended up being a hindrance uh, down the line to where I might have gotten injured or something like that. So where these things are all kind of in the back of my mind as I'm taking these interviews and they kind of move me to, rather than looking at just the healthcare disparity aspect, looking at how the insider outsider dynamic reflects and manifests itself in healthcare disparities, gentrification, food deserts, that sort of thing, because these things are a lot more interconnected than we're led to believe, so yeah. So at first, when Ugo first introduced to me the project, he gave me a lot of information at one time, and I was kind of confused on what exactly, you know, is a social boot documentary. And so I told him that we probably wouldn't be able to work on it till May, and that was in December, because I was working on three other films at the time. And I actually have two documentaries under my belt when I came and we started formulating our ideas for this one. So I didn't see the vision at the time until we started sitting down in person and we started talking about it and he would show me ideas and I'd be like, okay, you know, this is a really good idea. Um, but the second part of your question was about... Co yeah. Yeah, I think Ugo and what a lot of filmmakers who are first starting out, they have all of their ideas in their brain. They just need a way to put them out before. And so this is a whole nother process and a way of thinking for them than they had before. And so it's different for them because they're like starting out like for a lack of for lack of words, raw versus I've I've been going to school for this and I know off the bat, you know, what, how exactly am I supposed to do this? Um, so all of those ideas are in their heads. You just have to kind of pull them out and formulate them more. And he would throw me an, an idea and I'd be like, okay, how are we going to do that? You know, oh, here's what we can do. And we would bounce off ideas off of each other, you know? So I don't think, I think the main premise of the documentary was always set in stone. We never changed that. You know, he has these ideas in him. He, we were just slowly pulling them out and developing them. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. I did want to touch on what you, what you were saying um, because the main premise of my production company is to give young black creatives the stepping stone and the foundation to then enter the film world. And so a lot of times when you're a first filmmaker, you want to start out and it might not have been your major in college, 
you think that you should work on like a big set with a big production company when you go on that set it's very intimidating it's overwhelming and you don't want to you have questions but you don't want to sound like you don't know anything and everything so what my company does is we have these small sets these intimate sets to where anybody can walk on there and not feel intimidated and ask questions and gain experience and i can and it's just me telling them okay this is how this is properly supposed to go this is how you're supposed to do this because a lot of times on a professional set, they're not gonna answer your questions. You're not even allowed to ask questions during filming or anything like that. You're just supposed to know. Um, and it can be very intimidating and sometimes rude and mean versus over here, it's very welcoming and open. Yeah, and uh, building off of that, it's that was kind of one of the reasons I reached out to Mia. Um, I wasn't too, too familiar with her before, um, but then I ended up uh, looking at her work and um, it really kind of spoke out to me in the sense that um, I do, I think ahead a lot. And so in thinking ahead, I'm able to kind of see how things may go down the line to where it may sound crazy, but um, I really, this sort of like what we're, this environment right now, what's going on is, it was always something that I knew we could get to. Uh, it was just a matter of how that would happen. And so, with that being said, um, we've all, as I've worked with people, I've always tried to have. If I'm spearheading the work, I've always tried to create an inviting atmosphere. And so, um, in that first meeting with Mia, she was able to create an environment, inviting atmosphere as well. Because at the end of the day, I was reaching out to her. Um, she didn't necessarily have to hear me out. Um, as you guys can probably imagine, um, in kind of going through this process, um, I've reached out to people, um, and not that they brushed me off or anything, but I mean, sometimes there have been brush offs, and again, I don't take any of that personally, because it, at the end of the day, I know that's kind of a result of them not seeing my vision. But Mia saw my vision, and for that, I'm always gonna be grateful for that, and then on top of that, her seeing my vision, um, she was able to kind of immerse herself into my process, which is a very spontaneous and sometimes chaotic, but very fun process. And so I feel like that has kind of manifested itself throughout some of the things we've been able to capture in filming. So like literally, I think it was yesterday or the day before I brought it up to actually film some of it here. and that's why there's a camera back there and Clay is operating it right now. And that's gonna be something that um, is going to, as we see it in the film, you're going to kind of think to yourself, okay, that's why they did that. So it's kind of like operating on vibes, for lack of a better term, just, just kind of vibing it out and then ultimately knowing that no matter what we do, it's gonna stick and it's gonna work. So yeah. Yeah. yeah that was the next question. Okay. Yeah. Um. And I did forget Matt, so my apologies. But um, one big inspiration for me, um, if one used that word, uh, one big person I always kind of looked up to was. Um, John Singleton, um, so the director of Boys in the Hood, um, and not necessarily just because of his work, but because of the story behind his work. Um, I, in, in doing this, as you can imagine, I've done, I've always been big on researching things. When I was younger, I used to always just look up random facts and stuff like that. Um, so with that being said, um, John Singleton, um, he graduated from USC Film School, and so one thing about how Boys of the Hood was even made was he bet it on he bet on himself, um, and so in doing that, he kind of sent a draft of the film to I believe Columbia Pictures, and he really just kind of operated on the vibe that you know what I'm gonna do this, take this leap of faith, and I don't know how it's gonna work, but it's going to work. So that approach has always been kind of something that 
I have taken into anything that I do, work-wise, any, any type of work I do creatively, um, I've always taken that approach to it. And then along with that, um, I actually, as we were kind of brainstorming things, um, I actually um, started to look a little more at the French new wave of cinema, um, kind of that's in the 20, mid 20th century and things like that to where um, it, was in, it was a very honest brand of filmmaking and I've always tried to be honest in any work I do. So even some of the works that were up in the gallery that we had earlier this year, um, and I see Brianna's in the building. Hey Brianna, how you doing? Uh, but um, basically, in, I've always tried to be very honest with my work um, and generative rather than exploitative. Um, because being from Baton Rouge, um, you see a lot of unfortunate, unfortunately exploitation going on of a lot of the pains that this city has faced. And even expanding that outward to uh, surrounding areas like Zachary, Ascension Paris, anything like that, you see, and even New Orleans, you see kind of an air of pretentiousness, exploitation going on with um, some of the people that who, whose perspectives would be very welcome in this stew. And so my biggest motivation was to basically be like, to hell with that pretentiousness and we're going to do what we do. We're gonna create our own lunch table and we're gonna have a lot of fun at this lunch table. We're gonna bang on the table. We're gonna do rap battles and stuff like that. We're going to slide lunch across the table. We're gonna throw apples. We're gonna do whatever we have to do and it's gonna be authentically us and the world is gonna see that and someone in the world is going to appreciate that. And so that's, to answer your question, is kind of, uh, and to circle it back, actually, that's kind of what John Singleton did. And so ultimately, he was able to be nominated. He was one of the youngest nominees for, I think, Best Director or something like that. And the film was so authentically South Central LA. Um, you can go to LA back then, and you would think it's the same way as the film. So basically, that was kind of my biggest inspiration. So yeah. Um, so. This is a good question. So my inspiration for film would have to be Issa Rae because she's doing a lot of this stuff. Um, she's doing a lot of stuff right now and she has a lot of power and she's in her own lane and a lot of that stuff that she's doing, that's the type of level that I want to get to one day. And she has a very interesting story. You know, she started off a of YouTube making her own stuff and she brought that same process to HBO and she has her own show and, you know, she every single project that she is on it's authentic um it's it's good and it's not she's not working on more than one project at one time therefore she's putting so much energy into one project and every now and then she'll come up with you know something new and it's very entertaining everything that she has put out has been entertaining and she's just in her own lane and if you really look into uh people in power in film, it's mostly men. And even in the black community, it's mostly men, but then there are very seldom few black women. And so for her to be in her own lane on that level, I think is very inspiring. Um, so my answer is kind of, I guess, wayward. I would say my uh, motivation or inspiration comes from the quote, be like water, just because um, I've kind of submerged myself in different things in my life. I kind of have like different eras, if that makes sense. Like um, I was a gymnast and I swam and I did tennis and then I did acting, singing, all of that. And so kind of be like water encompasses all of that because you can really be fluid and like kind of tap into each one of the things that you really want to do. And it's just versatile and I don't know, it's a very flexible phrase, so it kind of, makes me want to be more flexible with all of the things that I know I can do and kind of be more, I guess, um, expressive in letting others know like what I have to offer and what I want to do. So um, that would kind of be my motivation, I guess. I say. Uh, any further questions by chance? OK. <laughs> This is ironic because it's like the outsider question that I ask everyone as we film. But basically for me, authenticity is 
um, never compromising your integrity for some sort of short-term material gain. And so um, one thing that I juggled with early on in the process of making this film was because at the end of the day, this, what this film has become has be, been something very homegrown and organic. And I feel that 110%, and I feel like anyone that comes on set or anyone that has been involved in the process can say that it feels extremely homegrown as well. And so early on, I faced the issue of kind of, and even looking for even working with, um, like incorporating the university into it in a sense, because I knew that was my most immediate source of funding, because I knew at some point I was going to need to get some sort of funds for this film. And so I joke, I'm big on creative autonomy, and so early on, I didn't want to sacrifice that because I've heard a lot of different stories, and I literally saw uh, last year actually um, at a, at a rally that um, this girl at LSU put on, um, I saw that kind of her creation get co-opted or hijacked in a sense. And it made me feel a way. And I was like, I wouldn't want this to happen to this film or anything like that. To where um, I also have a term that I kind of go by a lot, taxes always come back. And so basically what that means is you operate organically and altruistically with good intentions, pure intentions for your betterment and the betterment of people around you, that compensation will come back in some way, shape, or form. And so as we've started crowdsourcing and fundraising, um, it's like that's been the first I've seen some sort of monetary return from this. And that's going to fund our travels, basically. Um, and so I, wouldn't, I don't know that I would feel this good about it if I wasn't initially so authentic and like, you know what, I'm gonna be patient with this, I'm gonna allow it to simmer and build and everything like that because when the time comes, I'll be ready for it, we'll be ready for it. And so that authenticity has driven me to this point and it's going to continue to drive me um, when this film is done, beyond this film and for the rest of my life, so yeah. Okay, so being authentic to me is being real and being yourself. And it is the very foundation that I base a lot of my films on in my production company. So I mostly put out films and things like that to inspire young black filmmakers. And so I want black people to look at my films and see them like, okay, I. I see a, a black doctor on the screen, that's what I wanna be in. The language that they use, I use that at home with my family and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's being real and being true. And I feel like our culture is something that is very inspiring, it's very beautiful, and it's meant to be projected by us. And a lot of times when, even back then, let's say in the 70s, and even sometimes now, you have these black shows, but they're kind of corny and cheesy, and they say stuff that's like, we wouldn't even say that type of stuff because they're controlled by people who are not us. Sometimes they'll be, they'll be have white producers or white writers or a white production company, but when you see us, it's, it's authentic, you know? Um, you have a, a black producer, a black production company, and you have black writers in the room that are going to write things for, that are true and for your culture. And I think if you do anything that's the opposite of that, it's just disrespectful. Um, and a lot of people think that they know what we say and how we want to be portrayed on TV, but they don't. Only we know that. So being authentic is creating something that is real. And I want to create films that inspire us to look outside of what we've known for our whole lives and to know that we don't have to we don't have to have somebody with money or somebody who looks different than us to help us do something we can do it ourselves you know we can have our own table you know and so when you have that type of authentic representation it makes an impact and a difference and so that's what i wanted to do with my company and uh, my films um, to me, being authentic is kind of just um, pinpointing what really makes you, you. Um, for example, like my brother and I, we're Nigerian, so 
growing up in a Nigerian household or just kind of in the whole Nigerian culture, it's very cut and dry in a sense. Like some things are prioritized over other things. Like um, let's say academics, that's a very big part of our culture, so say. So our parents are very adamant about that. But um, me and my brother, we also have like other things that we fully have submerged ourselves into, which whether it be like acting or anything like that or sports. So we kind of had to put that on the pedestal while also keeping other things up that will kind of um, blend with our culture, if that makes sense. But honestly, authenticity is just finding a way to express yourself in the way that truly makes you feel empowered, if that makes sense. Um, if you can, Clay, I would also like you to come kind of give your sentiments on that answer, because I feel like that's an important perspective as well. Can you repeat the question? Um, well, for me, um, I, I mean, I, I just see it in everything Ugo does. It's just authenticity. It's, it's telling his story. Um, and it's what draws me to, to come back, um, and, and work with him every week and, and get this, get this project, uh, going and, and polished. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, um, it's just seeing Ugo follow his passions is what authenticity means to me, I guess. I appreciate that. Um, and so I guess we're just about, okay, it's 5.53. And so I kind of just wanted to give one last piece of my mind. And so basically, I want everybody to kind of just, you can close your eyes, you don't have to, uh, but just kind of visualize where you where you stand currently and where you will stand within the next year. And so ultimately I want to be able to kind of speak abundance into my life and I look to do that through this film and I hope that you guys are able to see that um, my authenticity Mia's authenticity, Uzo's, Clay's, Taj, everyone that's been involved in the process because we've been very honest with this process and um, we've been kind of doing it not just for the betterment of ourselves but for the betterment of kind of society at, loss, at large for lack of a better term for spaces like Yes We Cannibal. Um, I owe you guys, I'm very great, grateful for you guys because you guys have, whether directly or indirectly, ultimately kind of put the time in for this to be a reality. Those conversations I had with you, Matt, um, have been very fruitful for me. Um, so I appreciate that. And I hope, to, I hope that everyone in here continues to have conversations to kind of think about doing things and not just the cookie cutter way, if that makes sense. So uh, doing things abundantly and authentically in your own way. And I see a lot of, some of the people in here I know, and I see that you guys do that already. So I just implore you guys to keep that going um, because it's very important, especially in a society in which a lot of people are looking to others for their imagery rather than looking internally for their imagery. So the last thing I wanna leave you guys with is just looking to yourselves for your imagery whether that is in what you're doing academically, what you're doing athletically, what you're doing professionally, what you're doing artistically, or anything like that. And that's kind of my last remarks. Anybody else? Um, thank you guys for coming out and supporting us. And you know, if you guys have donated to the GoFundMe, thank you so much because we're almost you know close to our goal and it's just the first week that we really put out a lot of these promotional videos. And I just want you guys to continue to support artists that you feel like present a good story. Um, because a lot of times we don't get a lot of support and people, you know, 
question us about, you know, our careers and, you know, if this is really what we want to do, you know, but always, always support your artists because artistry is everything that you, that you see. It's, you know, when you go to the movie, somebody um, came up with that concept for the film. When you watch your favorite rapper or musician's music video, somebody filmed that. Somebody had to come up with the concept for the music video. It's in everything that you see visually. And it's funny because a lot of people look down on us about what we do because they don't think we're going to make enough money. It's not a traditional job, but people watch so much entertainment now, even during... Um, even during COVID, people watched Netflix and Hulu and things like that. And even back in like the first, the very first pandemic, you know, movie sales were still going up. So entertainment is in everything. It's everything that you watch, what you eat, sleep, breathe, what you listen to. And somebody had to create that. So please continue to support artists that you have faith in and that you believe in. Okay, well, with that being said, um, that's kind of all we have, but um, definitely appreciate it. We had a couple of last uh, things we wanted to sort of say. Was, okay. I, I just looked at the social boost skills fund me, and it's $340 short of the annual complete. That's very, very humble goal. I've heard that I've given a little bit, and I'm willing to give more today, even though we are in our own Marvel fundraising campaign, but I want to give an additional $100 today to use that as a perhaps. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So give if you can. Okay. All thank right. you guys for coming. Thank you so much for pulling up. <laughs> Definitely appreciate it. Anybody has any other personal questions? Mm -hmm.